episode four of The Drop today, April 17th. Uh, we have a fantastic guest on our program today. Thank you for those of you that are tuning in. Uh, MK and I are very excited about our guest today. We're going to get to him in a minute. Uh, things are going. We're in our fourth week here. I think MK and I are psyched that we are three episodes further in than we thought we'd ever be. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's been, it's been a, a great ride so far for us. We're having a lot of fun um, we, with it, that's for sure. We are having a lot of fun with it, and uh, we're getting some really great feedback. Um, it's nice that, you know, what we're putting out there is, is getting seen and heard, and, and people are appreciating it and, and sending us that appreciation and letting us know. Uh, it's a great thing. So uh, before we get to our amazing guest today, uh, MK, week four, how we doing, bro? What's going on? Uh, week four is... Um... I think I hit the wall on Monday, which was actually okay. Tuesday, which I thought was Monday. Going a little crazy, you know, kind of over it. And I feel like a lot of people that I've been speaking to are at that same point where they're they're over it. But but we know that we have to keep going on for uh, really the better of society. But uh, I reached my wall on Tuesday, which in my head was Monday. <laughs> I've lost, <laughs> lost track of days completely, and uh, today I'm much more positive today. I attempted to clean out the front hall closet of my house. I don't know why we have about 500 winter jackets, but that was my project for today. I got that done, and now I feel more positive than I was at the beginning of the week. Good. I will say that we were very excited that the Cunz Quarantine Kahoot did make its comeback last night. Yeah, it was um, on Tuesday. My, I, I completely forgot. And again, my, my heart just wasn't in it. But last night, I pushed myself to get that Kahoot done, especially yes, for, it, and for you, the three-time thank champion. Thank you. Yes, three back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. Thank you. Three back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. Yes, Skylar and I, it's interesting to do an art uh, Kahoot, for those of you who don't know what Kahoot is, Kahoot is an online, I guess it's a game, MK, right? Could we yeah, call it a game? A game? Yeah. It's like a game show. It's, right. it's, it's like, really for, like edu it's for education. Uh, we use it in the right. classroom, but we've taken it outside the classroom these last couple days. Right. We've used it in, in, right. We've used it in the classroom for like, like review, like project review. And like you ask questions and then, you know, it gets the kids engaged. Um, but Mike has brilliantly used it during quarantine twice a week, usually where he posts it live on Instagram on his feed. And then as long as you have the feed and then you have access to a desktop or a laptop, you can play along. And so it's gotten a little hyper competitive. I know Miss Ehrlich is sitting <laughs> in right now. She was hot on our tail last night, but Scott and I managed to pull out the third win in a row. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I have to say it's very interesting playing a, an art based quarantine kahoot game with a 17 year old who thinks they know everything about art <laughs> because her and i kind of like when, when the questions come up and mike throws some thumpers in there when the questions come up she's like dad it's this i'm like no it's not and she's like dad it's this and no it's not and then it's like fine we'll we'll do yours and i click on mine and yes mine's right and she's like oh fine yeah and my my family plays too and they have absolutely no clue about anything but they, uh, they but that's enjoyable anyway. because at least they admit it. Like, I love the yeah. fact that your brother gets the most frustrated of any person I've ever played. He has game no with knowledge of art at all. My family has no <laughs> knowledge, so but they... yet, but yet they're dedicated enough to come on knowing that there's no chance they're gonna win because there's nothing else to do, there's no other <laughs> options. Unfortunately, <laughs> their life has come to playing an online Instagram game. Uh, with 12 it's questions an, twice a week, that's it. Yeah, and again, we don't play for prizes, we play for pride, I like We play for say. pride, yeah, yeah, but it's an exercise in frustration for most people. So. Yes, exactly. Well, but still, it's, I, I, was, I was glad that the Kunz Kahoot has come back, has made a comeback. That, was, that made the entire night in the center house. We were all very excited about it. I that. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and I'm trying to, I think I felt a little bit of normalcy yesterday. I was finally able to get a spring cleanup for my yards. Uh, MK knows how we are both so fastidious about our lawn care uh, systems and, and how much pride we take in taking care of our yards. 
and I was going nuts looking outside and seeing how awful it looked. And finally, I was able to get my buddy Juan Palacios and his crew came over. They were nice enough to, to come over and did an excellent job cleaning up. So I felt like, like a little bit of relief. Yeah. I felt much better about that. It just, it was a little bit more of like, okay, maybe something's going to be normal for a little bit. I can, I can look at my backyard and not want to throw up. So that was, that was good. So, um, and then I just want to say, I am, I want to plug our boys in Violent Gentlemen. They I are saw a that the company. other day. It looks good. Yes. They are an apparel company out in California, um, a hockey kind of thing, which is actually great for our guest today from where he's from. Uh, but Violent Gentlemen is, I'll show you again, they are putting out a social distancing uh, sweatshirt and t-shirt line. Um, and all, uh, a lot of the proceeds from this line are going to help the healthcare frontline workers in California. So it's a great thing that they're doing. Uh, so thanks to the boys over at Violent Gentlemen. I've, I've bought quite a bit of stuff from them over the years. They, they make really quality stuff. It's really cool stuff. So thanks to them. Um, so with that being said, we have Alex Stewart in the house with us today. Uh, he is from the Pacific Northwest up in Vancouver, Canada. British Columbia, uh, our friendly neighbors to the north. Um, I have discovered Alex uh, a couple of years back on Instagram, as I usually do with, with our guests, uh, came up in my feed uh, and I looked at his work and I said, what is this? What is going on with this? I said, I got to start following whoever this is. And then I looked, him, looked into his stuff and just really, really cool stuff. I have a huge appreciation for street art and street art culture. Um, a lot of artists that I have befriended over the years are street artists who also have studio practices. Um, and what Alex is doing up where he lives is redefining, in my opinion, redefining the whole genre of what street art is supposed to be and what it, what it you know, has in the past been. Um, and I think that having him on the program today is fantastic because it's gonna open a lot of eyes and a lot of understanding about some of the preconceptions about it and how he's kind of shattering that. And he's just also an awesome human being. Like MK, I think we can, we can keep counting our stars with the people that we've had that's on. four in right? a row, that's four in a row. We don't accept non-awesome human beings, that's it. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's part of it. Alex, welcome to the show, my friend. How's it going in Vancouver, British Columbia? It's going really well. And I'm pretty excited about everything that's going on um, and really looking forward to just diving into what I've been working on with you guys. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's like stuff that we've, I've never really seen it before. Um, you know, we're in New York, so street art for us is, you know, pretty much all over the place. It's a common denominator for a lot of us. Up in yeah, you, Vancouver, you're fortunate Vancouver, that way. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I'm, I'm curious to know, how are you exposed to this genre of artwork being in Vancouver? What's that, what's that like growing up in Vancouver? Tell us about that. Uh, I mean, up until recently, we, it, I mean, for the past, I'd say 10 years, it's been illegal to even paint in skate parks here, um, which when I was growing up, that was a huge thing that you'd do is like skate parks used to be art installations basically, right? And um, and then we had the Olympics roll to town and the Olympic committee was like, no, we can't have graffiti, we can't have street art, just paint over everything. Uh, so, and that was back in 2010. So in 2010, basically, the, in my opinion, the street art scene died off uh, over here. And then I'd say four, four or five years ago, we got the Vancouver Mural Festival rolling through, and that kind of started opening a lot of people's eyes to uh, murals and street art again, obviously. And that kind of got the ball rolling to what I've been working on now and got me back into that scene. Because it's kind of disheartening when you go out there and you put something up and the next day it's gray uh, for a lot of us, right? And that's how yeah, it was I would, in Vancouver I would for imagine, a long time. Yeah. My next question is, where does art start to become a prominent part of growing up? Because we, we you know, when I think of Canada, I'm thinking everyone plays hockey, period. Like, I, did, I did play guy? hockey, so. <laughs> okay, so now what, you know, what is, as you know, coming through school, 
you know, for a lot of our students, a lot of their starting to discover their interest and their passion happens when they start coming into the high school. Like suddenly yeah. like, wow, this, this could be a legitimate avenue for me to do. Where does it hit you? And, and what, what is what's inspiring you to start thinking that this might be something you want to do? Uh, I'd say when I started skateboarding when I was 12, uh, that was the huge catalyst, just being exposed to different forms of art. But at the same time, like uh, my, my grandmother is a fantastic oil painter and has painted my entire life. So that kind of always was in the back of my mind. Like, do I want to be an artist? Do I want to go into something more, I don't know, traditional? Uh, I actually ended up doing the more traditional route. And I, uh, for about 12 years from grade 11 through to 12 years after that, basically, I, I worked as an automotive painter and I painted cars and I painted um, basically anything you can think of. I probably put paint on at some point in my life. Uh, and that got me into the whole scene of airbrushing and kind of refined my work with a spray can. I like growing up tagging when I was a little skid uh, was definitely like always in the background. So learning how to use a spray can better as I got older and started working on cars and stuff like that definitely was what helped me get to where I am now. It eventually hit the point where I, uh, working in a shop and working on cars kind of gets, I won't say it's, uh, yeah, I guess monotonous in a way because you, you're kind of doing the same thing all the time. There's not a lot of, there is creative freedom, but there isn't at the same time because it's always at, like, at the behest of someone else. And I wanted to stop doing that. So I started I just took a leap and started doing my own thing. Um, would have been five years ago now, I kind of just walked away from painting cars. Yeah, yeah. Now, when, when you graduated high school, you went to the university. What was your major in university? Um, I actually, so I took a year off after high school um, and just went full on into learning how to do paint cars properly and then eventually I right. about a year after that I decided that I was gonna go to school and I was gonna get uh, a degree and I actually ended up majoring uh, in printmaking and photography rather than what I do now which is painting but right. working in working in stencil is very similar to working in silkscreen so it was a really natural transition for me um, it's obviously a little cruder and a little different, but in my mind, it's very adjacent and works the same way. Right, right. And now up in that area, as you're starting to develop this, this appreciation and this interest for this particular genre, what influences are you getting in terms of uh, street art up in Canada in the Pacific Northwest? Not a lot. Um, uh, <laughs> most of what I, uh, most of my inspiration came from like, collecting juxtaposed magazines when I was growing up. And like in all of those, you know, I'd see like uh, Jeff Soto and Logan Hicks and uh, they'd always pop up. And then I was fortunate enough, um, I don't remember the date, but I was traveling and I happened upon uh, like a Shepherd Fairy gallery opening and I ended up going to that and that just opened my eyes even more. And that was probably verging on 10 years ago and that just, snowballed the, the the addiction i guess to yeah no it's, it, it's interesting the way that that you bring it up because i think chef brings a lot of people into that genre because of his not just the the technical superiority that he has as an artist but how global everything he does is and it really yeah. reaches so many people and so many people can relate every time he puts out another print or yeah. another you know Somebody's like, oh, I can, I can get behind that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's definitely a name that people recognize. I mean, even if you're not in the art world or even if they don't recognize his name, you're going to recognize his pieces just by, right. style, for, for, just by yeah. the style, of, style alone. Right. For people who are, who are listening in who might be f not familiar with that is Shepard Berry is, uh, is the artist who essentially designed the Hope poster for the Obama campaign. So if you, you, know, if you know that famous, that famous Hope poster, that's Shepard Berry. Everyone knows what a Shepherd Fairy piece looks like. You know, he's so um, synonymous with a certain look and a certain style, and that's what makes him a, a powerhouse brand of an artist. But the fact that he also uses his 
talent for social and political causes that he believes in is something I think that's very admirable too. That's why it's so appealing to people on so many levels. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're, you're exploring this whole opportunity, but on the side, you're a big environmental guy too. And, you know, living in that area, you kind of have to be. So, you know, we've been promoting all week on Instagram, you know, what, what if you're a street artist, but your quote unquote street is acres and acres of pristine Pacific Northwest forestry. Like, yeah. how does that, how does that work as a quote unquote street artist? So where do you get this idea being this guy who loves to hike and rock climb and get involved with nature? How do you put these two passions together? Where, where does the light bulb go on? Uh, I can't narrow it down to exactly when it happened. <laughs> But it came down to, I was a very stubborn student (laughs) and uh, all through university, my teachers would, or my professors would be like, you need to have like some underlying meaning to your work. Otherwise it, it won't strike a chord with anyone. And I was like, no, I just want to paint for the sake of painting. Um, And then eventually that just gets old, right? Uh, So I hit a point where I, I started thinking and uh, a whole bunch of things happened in my life at one point, and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna try and just dive into my art and do something that means a lot to me, and that came with, you know, uh, in some way drawing attention to our lack of care for our forests, and just, like, uh, the mentality of, oh, it's gonna be someone, it's someone else's problem in the end, like never take never taking ownership uh, for yourself and your own actions, and I feel that's like a lot of what goes on in nature and in life in general, really. Uh, so I just wanted to use what I can do to, I guess, challenge people's mindsets. And it hits or miss. Like either someone, either you really love what I do, or it infuriates you that I'm going out into nature and doing something. But either way, I'm starting a conversation, so I'm winning. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, for people who don't know how much passion and, and love you have for the environment, they don't realize that everything that you're doing is biodegradable and eco-friendly, yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah. So I make everything what, myself. What you, <laughs> right. So what are you what are you using to ensure that nothing that you're actually putting on gets permanently damaged? How does that work? Um well like I don't physically paint on the trees. What I'm doing is I'm using a handmade, like a homemade rice paper. So it's very, it's basically nothing. Um, And then I'm painting on top of that with a a tempera paint that I make myself and using like earth pigments and natural pigments to tint it. Um, And when I do that, it, uh, it, I don't know, I've, because I live on an acreage, so I did a lot of experimenting here first. And uh, I wanted to make sure that the lifespan of my paintings were going to be very minimal. Um, so the, it took a while and I have like one piece that I did early on still on my property and it still hasn't gone away, but I feel cause it's in my own controlled environment. It's all right. Um, right. So I eventually took that and I got the process narrowed down to where I can wheat, like I just use wheat paste. It's just flour and water and a little bit of sugar and then the rice paper and the tempura and then that's it and it generally washes away by the next rain if not it deteriorates in about a month to maximum two months um, and then they're just gone so uh, I document them as they decay and I go back and check the sites that I put them in and make sure that they're going away and not damaging anything so it's it was a process that took me about a year to get dialed in. And now that I've got it there, I, I'm still playing with it because uh, the tempura paint that I use right now, I use uh, egg yolks uh, to, as the base. And I want to try mm-hmm. and get away and use something a different. I don't know, different, but like maybe narrow down um, like, a, like almost a wheat paste version where it's more of a flour based tempura rather than a, uh, an egg based tempura. For you know everybody listening in, especially for our, our students who are always you know willing to try new things, this is a great example of trying to 
find not only what works for your your aesthetic vision, but learning how materials work and how they interact. You know, a lot of a lot of artists start using things and don't realize that over the course of time, a lot of stuff that we use is physically dangerous to us when we use it. You know, so many of these, you know, I love to oil paint, but I also have to be very aware of the toxicity of the thinners and all the additives and some of the paint yeah. itself, if it's a lead based paint, MK, what, like, like your painter too, can you, you know, you want to add into that? I mean, how, how difficult it can be. Yeah. You just gotta, you gotta always be careful of the materials that you use. And, uh, but what I love about Alex is doing, it just shows his commitment to, to his craft. The fact that he's, he's not settling for, you know, something that's going to obviously damage the environment, but also it, it gives him more control over his material so he can, you know, really fine tune it to what he wants it to be. You know, uh, in my AP class, we, we, the students do these um, sustained investigations where they're supposed to dig deep into a topic. And, you know, that that's a sustained investigation on its own, it, you know, just to think about the materials and explore your materials not just materials that you would get in the store, but to really to dig deeper and to to try to make your own materials. Like I said, it gives you more control and makes your your work more your own in a way. You know, because yeah, nobody's yeah, going to have the have those same materials that you're using, and you could fine tune them to exactly the way that you like. You know, it's just like um, certain types of pencils or certain types of sketchbooks that certain people like, or um, papers, but now you have that control to control the paint, which is really cool. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's very much like, like I always compare it when we do, um, the underpainting project in, in the upper level classes that we teach, it's the difference between like driving a car with a manual transmission and an automatic transmission. Like with the manual transmission, it takes a little bit more to learn but you have so much more control over the ability to what you're doing with that vehicle. And it's kind of the same, same kind of scenario where you're dealing with materials that it's also very classical. I mean, you're talking about yeah. artists who would make pig bins from scratch. Yeah. Right. I mean, and you almost have to be part scientist as well as part artist. Like you have Absolutely. to really know the chemical, properties of what you're using and and being conscientious of not wanting to do anything that causes lasting damage either to yourself or to whatever it yeah. is you're using it on and i think yeah. that's why it's so it's it's brilliant what you've come up with because you still have the ability to have that quote unquote street art vibe to your stuff but it's all natural everything about it is natural yeah and i I think one of the things that helped me a lot with that was like my back, my background in particular, like being an automotive painter and going through all of that training. It's, I spent, you know, a decade mixing different colors and different paints from more or less scratch, just using a base. But it also came down to a realization that, you know, working with urethanes and working with epoxies, that's not good for anyone really. Yeah. Um, so I took, I made a choice to step away from that and go a completely different route. And thankfully, like that whole industry is slowly evolving and slowly changing, but a lot of the products they use are still terrible. Yeah. But even in just, this, even in the, in the street art industry, like I know that they're, they're trying to like Montana, which is a huge spray paint company has a whole line of water-based spray can stuff now. Have you ever yeah. used any of that stuff? Have you tried any of that stuff? Um, I haven't used theirs. I used um, in my like in my studio practice, I use Iron Lax um, version, which is their sugar paint, uh, which is a sugar cane based spray paint. Um, so it's all like no oils. It's all alcohol, water and sugar cane based. Um, and it works awesome. I love the color lines that they have. So I'm going to stick with that while I can you find that it's just as effective as like the regular Montana's and the Krylons and all that other stuff. Yeah. I, I mean the, uh, like the pressure is a little different in the can and some of the colors aren't as vibrant. So, I mean, with some studio work and some murals, I'll go back to like Montana black or something if there's a certain color that I need, but other than that, I'll try and solely use um, the sugar, but just because it's better. Well, in my mind it's better for the environment. Um, 
uh, and then I, I mean, getting a, anything in Canada is a little harder. Like I can't get um, the uh, Molotov like all for one. I can't get that here. Really? Or it's like a really drawn out process to get it here. Um, like even with the sugar, I order it from California and I have to go pick it up across the border in Bellingham. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, in that's very interesting that, that, that you have to do that. Is there a reason for that? What's um, our regulations are really stiff when it comes to any paint of in Canada. Um, and I just don't think that Iron Lack has put in the effort to like get their paint to pass board up here so they can't ship it directly to us. Um, and if they do, it costs like twice as much. So I'd just rather go yeah. across the border. Yeah, yeah. But I also think that that's, that's, that's actually admirable on the part of your country because they're so concerned with keeping things, you know, in a conservation mindset, like they're yeah. very concerned about that. So that's, it's, I mean, as frustrating as it probably is for an artist, it's actually really applaudable for humankind. <laughs> yeah, more no, for sure. With the environment. Yeah. Um, and then I, just before I forget about it, cause I was talking about paint and you asked me to bring one of these up. So that's yeah. what I use to spray like my, my handmade paints. So I still get the effect of street art and it just like gets siphoned up through out of the mason jar and gets atomized the same, um, like same, same, basically same spray cap, same everything. So it's just yeah. a, it's yeah. a pressure. Is it a pressurized can that you put? Yeah. Something? It's a little, it's a little like aerosol can that just somehow, I don't exactly know how it works, but it just sucks the paint out of the mason wow. jar and sprays it out. Yeah. Now, is that is that something that you had to experiment making yourself, or how did you find that? Like, it's a it's a red. It's um, made by a company called Prevail, and it's just a little touch up spray paint or spray kit that is used generally in like house finishing. What's the the life out of that can? Like, how long will that? Is it the equivalent of using a regular spray can, or yeah, basically the equivalent of a spray can? It'll last just as long. It'll hold the same amount of paint about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's wow. That's really, I mean, that's, it's incredible that you have the wherewithal to think that far ahead and, and really do your research. And that's why it's so important for young artists to think through. And that's the thing that MK and I have been trying to impart, you know, the juniors in the advanced placement classes and the seniors in the portfolio classes. These are, you know, when, when MK talks about sustained investigation, it's not only about the actual finished work being the sustained investigation, it's yeah. everything that goes into it. It's and an it's the in, thought in depth, in depth research, really, about your art, make, yeah. art and your art making process. Right, yeah. your art making we process. We mentioned this last time that the, the process is as important as the finished result. You know, you, correct, you should, correct. If you're making art and you're not enjoying the process you're not making art yeah right right so where does it where does it where does it blur the line between this being a job and this being something that you just couldn't live without for the rest of your life uh i I'm, i don't know i don't think it can be one without the other really um for me it's i mean i i'd still be making what i'm making if, if i wasn't making money off like it doesn't, right. for me, it's, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I think that it's like a, it was a, that was a very practical part of my university experience is um, my one professor, uh, Chris, who I still talk to and I still go give lectures to his classes. Um, he kind of imparted that knowledge onto me is we're in a different era now. You can't be an artist and live in someone's loft of their barn and pay them with paintings anymore. Like that's not a sustainable way to live. So right, right. you always need to half think about um, what if I need to do something to kind of supplement my art, right? Um, and that's where my painting cars came in and like just doing, cause like it, it, it's hard, it's hard to accept at some time, at some points, but it's very hard to, at least in the early stages of being an artist, to just make art. There's always something else that you're doing. And then it's just trying to find that balance between the two where you can still be inspired every day 
and not be exhausted from doing what else you're doing to like survive. Um, right. There's, there's a, and there's somebody in the audience listening right now, Mr. Aridi, who uh, Frank Aridi, our, our buddy who was on episode two, who holds down a full-time job, but is also a phenomenal artist. Frank, do you want to buttress that and, and add your experiences in? Frank, I'm you there? there. Yeah, I'm here. How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Good, good. You want to you want to kind of piggyback on that? I mean, we know that you talked in your in your episode about working, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours sometimes a week and then still painting on top of that. How is that for you? Uh, it's hard at times, but you know, this is uh what I enjoy doing and I love the the challenge of painting and uh the challenge of um of making things uh in the studio i love doing these things so you know i'm there tired i'm there when i'm fully you know energized and i'm just there uh a lot of that time i'm making work and sometimes i'm not but <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know that's yeah. that's where i want to be i want to be in the studio so um yeah, it's tough, but you, you got to stay motivated. And as you guys were mentioning earlier, keeping it fun, you got to love the process and, uh, you know, uh, at least love searching for if you're not already loving what you're making, you know? Right, right. That's a great point. Thanks, Frank. It's really a balance. It's an interesting balance. And, you know, even as, uh, as educators too, you know, you're putting in full days we feel lucky that we can have that energy all day long. Like when you're with the kids and you see them producing and see them getting excited about what they're producing, that translates and brings it back to my studio. I know personally for me, and I always, I joke with the kids all the time. Like, I don't know. And you know, our superintendent is listening right now. Dr. Berg is listening. So I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, Dr. Berg. But I, you know, I don't think that there's, particularly math teachers that go home and after dinner are really excited to do math after dinner, after doing <laughs> math all, all day long. But I, you know, I might be wrong. I don't know, but I you know that know. for me, <laughs> you never know. But you know, when I'm in the, I'm in the studio, some kind of studio atmosphere from seven o'clock in the morning until at least three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon. And then I go home and then I spend time with my family. We do what we have to do. But then at like nine o'clock at night, nine thirty at night, I get to experience that environment again. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's like you know when you're when you're putting yourself around it so much, it really is. You know, it, I think that passion. It's we consider ourselves very lucky that we have that passion twenty four seven, basically. Yeah. And I I so I that kind of like adds to something that I get asked a lot. And I, or a lot of people say to me that they always say, oh, you're so talented. It must be nice. And I'm like, it's, I, in my mind, it's less about how talented the person is and more about how passionate you are about what you do. Yeah, definitely. If you have passion for what you're doing, it doesn't feel like work anymore, right? Like as Absolutely. long as you thoroughly enjoy it, then, and that's, I've, I've said that to a, lot, a couple of, of students that I've talked to before as well. And they say oh like it like you're so talented I'm like no I've just been passionate and I've probably put in you know 20,000 hours into what I'm doing Absolutely. like it's it's Absolutely. it's more it's more time time measured than talent latent talent in my talent, mind, talent is probably the smallest portion of it you know you get yeah. I mean we always have students come into our classroom and they say oh I'm not good at art it's not that they're not good at art it's just that they haven't worked at it yet it's like anything else exactly. the more time the more effort that you put into it the better that you're going to get out of it reason why i wasn't good at math is because i wasn't passionate about math it wasn't that i'm i'm not good at it it's just that i didn't want to take that time to really learn it um yeah. well we're picking on we're picking on math a lot today oh, sorry, sorry math there's no math a lot of bullying math well, <laughs> i'll change the subject we'll we'll say oh, I mean, we'll say it, it's <laughs> It's I'm just true. Saying, though, it's just, talent is just such a small portion of it. It's 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 hard work. It's dedication. It's like that with athletics and and you know hockey players, baseball players. To get to that that highest level, yeah, they have talent, but they worked and worked and worked. And it's the same thing with you to get to where that your level 
that you're at now. You probably worked at it. And to get to the level that you want to be, you're going to continue to work at it. Yeah. And you can, uh, I forget, it was recently that uh, I was just scrolling through Instagram and one of the artists that I follow had something up that said something along the lines of, uh, the moment you're satisfied as an artist with what you've done is the moment you lose. And that's the moment that art kind of dies. Because if you're not satisfied with what you're doing, there's nothing else. Or if you're satisfied with what you're doing, you're not going to push forward anymore. Yeah. Right? And how and the satisfied you stop, are you ever about what, with what you're doing, right? Almost never, never. right? <laughs> never. <laughs> yeah. Never. Like, yeah. You're always your own biggest critic when you're an artist or you're a designer yeah. or a creative in any type. You're, you're always your biggest critic. Yeah, but then the second that you feel like, oh, this is my masterpiece. I can't do anything better than this. That's the moment that it's, you, you're not an artist anymore because you've stopped working. Exactly. Right? Yeah, um, yeah. We, and we alluded to that, I think, on the last program where, you know, when things don't become challenging or don't feel like you're pushing yourself, things get stale. And then that's when it kind of dies off and the passion dies off because you don't feel like there's, there's a fire there anymore. Yeah. Like you, you have that inner, that, that burning desire to better yourself or to, you know, go that extra distance or try that new material or research how am I going to do what I really love to do, but yet not be damaging to something else that I really love to do, which exactly. is where you're at, basically. Yeah. The second you're not scared, you're not winning. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great quote. It, <laughs> And, that's another T-shirt. That's another T-shirt, the right there. That's a, that's a <laughs> idea. That's a fabulous. Can you say that? Idea. Can you say that again? Just <laughs> put that on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> the second you're not scared, you're not winning, is what I just yeah, said. I like that. Yeah, see, that's that's fantastic. But that's you know that's why we bring on people who are creative with that kind of mindset. You know, people like Frank, people like Alex, people like Vic, people like Miguel, like people who you know, obviously do have a talent and obviously have worked very hard at that talent, but who also want to do something with it that's meaningful, that has some resonance to it, that carries weight to it. And it's not necessarily, you know, I'm going to say this because I don't like this politician, or I'm going to say this because I don't like this social injustice that's happening. I think it's, it's coming, your work comes from a very organic place. It comes from literally and figuratively, I mean, but it yeah. comes from a place that, that you care about, like you really care about it. And you've, you've had the ability to find what you love to do and put it into an environment that you also love to be in. Yeah. Right. I yeah, mean, that's, I, I, yeah. And I think that that's, that's really why it, when I look at your Instagram feed and I see the stuff that you're putting out, it just, it blows my mind that you have, you're so self-aware of where you're putting these things just to look at these pieces when, you know, I mean, I'm not a hiker. Um, so I, you know, I don't know the experience of walking through the woods and looking for things or finding things or discovering things, but that's really the whole, the whole position that you've put your art in is to be discovered correct yeah so tell us and, a little uh, bit about that philosophy what's that philosophy i i i don't even know where it all kind of stemmed from but because i kind of got actively involved in like the rock climbing community about six years ago and started helping you know trail build and develop trail systems and areas and all that type of stuff um, and I think that's where most of my work now has come from. Um, but even with what I've been doing is I'll create a piece in my studio and I'll get it ready to go. And I'll walk for hours just trying to find the right place to put it. That's not going to be like, I don't want to go bushwhacking with a machete. I want it to be somewhere that it just organically fits. Right. Um, and a lot of that comes down to like, a little bit of the mentality of like leave no trace but I'm leaving I, I am leaving something obviously but I'm doing it in a way that isn't gonna harm anything and I, I, I do it in places that I know it's gonna um, be taken back like I do it in a way where it's gonna it's gonna grow over it's gonna feed the moss it's gonna feed something like it's not gonna damage it um, right and right. 
it sometimes like I've spent like I still have a couple of pieces in my studio that I haven't found places that I feel comfortable putting them yet and that's just kind of how it all works out it's just like a very um organic process where I don't rush anything I don't uh, I don't just go out and be like oh, I'm just going to put it here it needs to be the perfect location right it all kind of happened rather quickly and I obviously change it up when I can and I want to do like large like larger in installations but for larger ones I want to reach out and go through the proper channels because I don't want to just walk into a national park and have a ranger walk up to me and be like hey um yeah you shouldn't be here uh, <laughs> right like yeah I want to because for some of the things that I have in mind I want to work with you know the Parks Board of Canada or any other Parks Board and kind of do something that's going to be directly in the public eye rather than hiding them how I have been right yeah. uh, and I feel like a larger piece could have you know a larger message obviously right right it's interesting to hear you explain the whole thing because it sounds to me like the work <laughs> informs the environment not the other way around i always was under the impression when i watched your feed that you kind of scout areas out first and then you're like mm, something would look good there but it doesn't sound like that it sounds like no. you're just doing the work yeah right i just i just do the work and hope that it fits somewhere <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, and that's, I think, MK, right? That's part of the pro that process, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, too. We said, like, um, we were talking previously that um, you don't really know if people are going to see these pieces or you don't, you know, no. I, asked, I asked you, like, do you consider the fact of where you're putting it? You know, if you want to talk a little bit about that, like, these decisions on, you know, do you put them in places in parks that people, that you know that they're going to go there or not? Yeah, and I I do to a point, but I also want them to be uh, hidden. I want them. I I want you to not like walk directly into it. I want it to be like a little bit of an accident, or you stumble into it. And I've had people tell me that they stumbled into them and it scared the living hell out of them, or they stumbled into them and it was like a really magical experience, depending on the time of day or the circumstance or your mindset that day. Um, especially like with some of my portraits that I put out there. They're not like, I, I try my best to do very um, emotional portraits and uh, portraits that in some way can be, uh, I don't like my new, my, one of my newest paintings, I did it with uh, to the point where it just kind of stares at you wherever you are in the forest. And that's a little creepy to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> but um it I also feel like that kind of helps start the conversation about you know a lot of people like we talked about uh, previously where they'll go for a walk in a park and they'll their dog will take a crap and they'll just pick it up put it in the bag and put the bag on the trail and like right. people see that like someone's always going to see what you they might not know it's you but you're going to be judged for your actions when, regardless of where you are. Um, and I think that a lot of people have that mentality outside where it's one of those things where it might take a little bit more effort on your part in the short run to leave less of an impact, but a lot of people don't want to put in that effort. Um, it's a little bit of laziness, a little bit of selfishness and, uh, I feel it's a lot of that mentality of, oh, it's someone else's problem. Someone else will deal with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that actually leads me to a, an interesting question that we had addressed with you in, in the pre-show check that we did earlier in the week. Do you feel like as someone who's so connected to nature and so concerned with the environment and conservationism and, and giving back, do you feel like this time being where we are in this quote unquote quarantine and, and kind of letting the earth reset a little bit, do you feel like we'll have a reset of our human relationship with the environment or is that being too hopeful? Uh, I mean, you, you have to be hopeful. <laughs> I, I don't think you can get through this time that we're in without be having a little bit of hope, right? And right. I, I am hopeful that it will, I mean, 
at the very least spark that new connection with nature. Um, but I know like up here, we just shut down all of our national and provincial parks just because they did get overwhelmed with people who were like, oh yay, it's basically a vacation. But it's not, right? Like this is our time to like stay home and make sure that everyone else is safe. Don't go out and treat it as time off, right? Right, uh, right. Um, so I, I do hope that it will come back and people will appreciate nature more now and maybe take more care of it. But I mean, I, I'm not too hopeful on that front. I, mean, yeah. I think that uh, people, I mean, I, I realized this in these last couple of weeks that, you know, the fact that people are staying home and a lot of business, businesses are, are shut down, they're not driving as much. Um, I think people see the, I mean, I know in China, like the smog is lifted in, in, in China and um, there's been a lot of uh, benefits for the environment because people are staying home. And I yeah, think definitely. it's really interesting. I mean, even over here, I've been talking to my mom lives right across the street from me and we talk about like the birds and the squirrels that we see, but like all of a sudden on my lawn, I have like black squirrels, which were never there. And then we have rabbits on our block, which we didn't <laughs> have before. And I'm like, well, yeah. now they don't have to worry about getting hit by cars when they're crossing the street. I mean, I, I think that we are, I mean, hopefully people are starting to see that, you know, these changes that unfortunately that we're making right now, though, they are having a positive benefit on the environment. And, and if we yeah. do put our mind to it, uh, it is something that we can fix, just like we destroyed it. It is something that we can fix. I mean, are we going to fix it by shutting down everything? Probably not. But I think there's like changes that we could make to our everyday lives that obviously that would the environment would benefit from it. And I think that people will see that when this is yeah. all yeah. done. You know, the, the air is, you know, easier to breathe. I go out at night to take my garbage cans out or something. And you don't even, the noise pollution, I don't hear any cars. It's like, it's bizarre, you know? Yeah. And I, I hope that during this time, it'll like help people realize what's actually important and what you want, yeah. you know? Um, and like, even over here, like we got to jump on it really fast and basically shut every like we had five cases and they're like okay well we're shutting down restaurants um and uh our like we don't have a lot of smog or pollution out here but even we've noticed a difference like our skylines are brighter like we get more stars and i'm hoping that people will realize that and not just try and jump right back to where we were right yeah. take the good yeah. aspects of what we've experienced right now and keep them and then do what you can to maintain this level of care i guess right right do you see yourself in in the role that you play as a visual artist do you see yourself as a communicator and as a i don't want to say a harbinger of what could be but how serious do you take your role in promoting that mindset to people as a visual artist? Like, uh, is it gonna inform your work going forward more to be more proactive with getting people to notice? I, I think it will, and I think it's gonna be hard to not go that route. Um, like we, what we talked about uh, earlier, earlier in the week is like, as an artist, it's kind of our job to chronicle what's going on right now and make basically make sure it's not going to happen again right? Yeah. right uh and i i think it would be foolish to not go with that route and not try my best to at least inform and try and change as many minds as i can right yeah yeah and i think you know it, it's it's interesting that it's already technically doing that but for somebody who's like myself who's not a hiker who's not out on the trails, who's not noticing those things, how would you go about bringing that kind of insight to someone like me who, you know, wasn't, until I saw your stuff, I wasn't aware of that, those kinds of issues at all, because it's not something that's directly in my backyard, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, and so I have brainstormed this. I haven't put it into action and I, I can't really put it into action right now. Um, but I've thought about taking the like the biodegradable aspects of my work and bringing them into the city, but doing it not so much as a portrait, like because what there's like a duality to my work in a way where I bring aspects of humanity into nature, and I want to 
see about bringing aspects of nature into you know urban areas and humanity uh and do it where say i do a port or a, a stencil or a wheat paste of a flower but have it engineered to where it will rapidly rot and decay in the city um, right right and play with that aspect of it as well right mm. yeah that's i think that that would be a fantastic thing because it's it, I, I feel like the message that you are putting out there is so important, but yet it's falling on, it's, it's essentially preaching to the choir. Like you're, yeah. the, people who are, the people who are out hiking are usually the people who appreciate nature to begin with. So yeah. how, do you, how do you get that message to somebody who's more of an urban lifestyle, who's like, ah, yeah, I'll throw my coffee cup out the window because, ah, you know, the squirrels will grab it and drag it into the bushes. It's not a big deal. Like, how do you reach that person? Uh, so that, that's a hard one because I don't know. Uh, I think people that throw trash out the window of their car are already committed to that, and it's very hard to change their mind, right? It goes along the lines of the, the same people that, like, flick cigarette butts out their window and stuff like that. Like, it's not... In in my mind, it's just laziness. It's not that hard to have an ashtray in your car, right? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you do it through your through your social media. You know, the images, yeah. that you post. I mean, the, your your social media is really like beautifully done. The the photos, the quality, the imagery, and um, you know, your work is amazing to look at. But the environment in which you put your work is amazing to look at, and it, yeah. it's almost like you're a conservationist for nature, like we think about going to zoos and a lot of people when we think about zoos, yes, it's animals in cages, but it's to, to really show the beauty of these animals and to show the importance of these animals. So that way we do protect them in their natural environments. And, you know, when we look at your work and we see the surroundings that your work is in, you know, it's beautiful and it's something that we want to last. It's something that we want to always be there. Um, you know, and I think that's, I think you are doing that. I think you're doing it through your, I mean, at least through your social media, I, I could tell yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. How how important is that that Instagram feed? Because you are on there pretty actively. I mean, is is it something that you're using more as a tool to get that message out in addition to the work? Yeah, and uh, I mean, that is really the only way I think to get to reach people who don't go out into nature is through showing the images of it and like having. I think maybe I should go a little bit further and try and do like larger pieces or make them. Um, uh, I mean, I, I wanted to do it now because we have a gorgeous stretch of weather, but I stay, I'm stuck at home. Right. I had these right. big plans to do this. Uh, I was going to do a road trip and start taking my pieces to uh, like clear cuts and forest fire burn sites and doing the portraits like, but make them very sorrowful in those environments, right? To draw more attention to all the clear cutting that goes on, all the forest fires that happen and everything like that. So that's uh, a future goal of mine is to like, my feed is very green and alive and I want to change that to the darker side of what goes on in nature as well, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's now, you, it sounds like you're trying to switch gears to showing what we're losing not yeah, just the exactly. beauty of what we have yeah, yeah yeah and that's i think that's and it's what i like also about it is it's not overly political it's not overly preachy for a lack of a better term like you're not shoving it down people's throats like like you're 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 trashing things and you're bad and you're doing this and you're bad yeah. like you're you're kind of giving like a very very subtle hey why don't you think twice about what you're doing first and see and, and that's kind of how i've always been with this is it goes along the lines of if you call someone out on something they're automatically going to get their back up but if you can subtly suggest it's been their idea all along then it kind of works yeah you're right, leading by right. example yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and you and and it's even more interesting if you can if you can psychologically convince somebody that the idea is theirs even if exactly it's yeah. yeah and trying to be like oh you know you should have i can't believe you thought of that and they're like yeah i know right and then it's like all of a sudden now it clicks and you've got them to do what you want them to do and that's what yeah. your artwork is essentially doing and that's the brilliance of it is that you're kind of your your mind 
changing people without them aware of the fact that their whole thought process is being changed. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's kind of the goal. And that's like, uh, with a lot of like the murals that I've been working on, I was sadly supposed to be painting one right now, but that was put on hold. Um, uh, and I always do it along the lines of like just bringing aspects of nature. Like all of my murals are very colorful and like full of flowers and everything like that. And, um, just bringing that color and beauty of nature into an urban landscape. And like the one that I painted this time last year, I, it was just preserve what you love. And I feel that's something that I work towards. And I think everyone right now is working on, right? Like we want to kind of preserve our way of life because if we don't, then uh, we're going to come out of this not where we want to be, right? Yeah. And there again is that underlying sense of this global community where, you know, we, we keep bringing on guests who are not just so talented in what they do, but have this goal in mind to connect everybody and keep us all connected. And, yeah. and we've said it on every episode, this is not the time to be isolationist. It's the time for ideas to be shared and for people to stay connected. And that's exactly what your work is doing. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's, well, it's like we, we mentioned earlier in the week. It's like our like my like our generation has never had this unifying event, right? Where everyone's experiencing the same thing at once. Yeah. That's not that hasn't happened in my lifetime. So, yeah. right. it it it's it's hard to not let that influence what you're doing, and it's going to be hard to not let it influence what you do going forward from this either, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, wow. I mean, I keep, I blinked and I'm looking at the clock and it's, we've been on for an hour already. <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe we've been on for an hour already. Do we want to open it's up? It's the only the time of the week that flies by. Yeah, really, <laughs> Every so other hour is the slowest hour of the week, except this hour, which is over in about 10 minutes. It's true. It's true. If you have a question for Alex, um, that you would like to ask, if you want to be on audio, just put a question mark. Um, and we'll open up your audio and see if you want to ask Alex anything. Uh, oh, Dad's got a question. Okay, Dad's got open, up, Dad. <laughs> open up. We're gonna Dad's need to get like audio. some type of like jingle or segue for your, your dad here. Every time he has a question, we need like something. Here we go. All right, Mr. Open Senna, up. you're on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I do have a kind of a question and a statement at the same time. Hi, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You know, when I saw some of the work that you've done, first thing that came to my mind was a place in Manhattan called the High Line. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, I have not, no. It's an interesting concept. They took an old um, elevated railroad that's been out of uh, operation for years, and they turned it into a park. And the whole idea is to kind of preserve the environment and as I saw your work, the first thing that came to my mind was this would be an excellent place for him to present your work. And um, just wanted to throw it out there as an idea. Yeah, that's... yeah, it's been out of service for decades. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and they've they've really done a, a tremendous job, you know, redesigning what the usage is. Um, and I I can see that. I can definitely see that, Dad. That's that's yeah. really a, a cool concept. Oh, uh, Dr. Burak has typed something, but I want to hear it. I want to hear. I want to open up her audio. Let's her. Let's give her a shout out. Let's, oh, there we go. Hello, hello, a Alex. Thank you so much for spending an hour with these two crazy guys. <laughs> My pleasure. We, we we love them as teachers, and they, their kids love them. They they give a lot of time uh, to our students, and um, they really encourage everyone to explore their talents and. Uh, to rise above and be the best they can possibly be, or as they say, the finest, finest. And uh, I just right. wanted to uh, share with you, thank you for joining in their efforts to uh, bring uh, different types of styles to our students. I, I see some of the kids. So hello, kids. I hope everything's okay with you in your home. And um, just want to say hello. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. Thank you, Dr. A, a, a a great, great supporter of what we do. She's a huge champion for our program. We, we, we couldn't get a lot of it done without her support. It's been an honor for us this past hour to be able to have you give us your time 
and talk a little bit about you, you know, what you care about and how important it is for everybody. And uh, it's a great thing, dude. I mean, I, I really, I, you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know MK, yeah, thank you know, you. he I appreciates got, it too. I got one last question, non-art related. Okay. All right. Bigfoot, <laughs> real or myth? <laughs> I got to know, know your opinion. I have to. Uh, uncertain. How about that? Uncertain. Okay. okay. I'll take that. <laughs> uncertain. Have, you, have we seen some kind of proof along any trails that you've been on that there's something might be out there? Uh, no, but I have had this, this shit scared out of me a few times on trails. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. All right. That's good to know. Yeah. So again, Alex, thank you so much for joining us, my friend. It's just been um, just a fantastic experience for us. Um, and Joe, Joe P just, oh, it's Joseph's iPad is Mr. Pilata. I didn't realize it's his iPad. And he just said, if you're not crazy, you're not winning. Put uh, Let's put Mr. Pilata on. I, I would love to hear that. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. How are you? Hi. Another stellar performance by all of you. Alex, thank you so much for being on. Really appreciate it. No problem it. at all. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to hear from the other side of the country and how you guys are doing over there. Yeah. Actually, a different country, but <laughs> yeah. definitely on the left Basically coast. the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's yeah. for sure. That's but uh, uh, we, we just want to thank you and, of course, to Tom and to MK. Um, look forward to these. Mike, you hit it right on the head. It's it's the fastest hour of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so, it really is. That's yeah. great. Thank yeah. you, Joe. Thank you. I just oh, sit there been... and finally get a chance to chill and not worry about emails coming in. But uh, to all your students, um, I, I know how much this means to them. So, uh, again, just kudos to you guys and just keep keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Joe. We hope, uh, we hope everybody by you is safe and healthy, too. Keep, yes, keep very it. much so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good, good. Thanks. All right, Alex, thank you for a great, a great program. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, definitely going to keep watching what you're doing. And uh, anything you need from the U.S., man, you need support from here. You need us to, <laughs> to, to smuggle. Let us know if you ever come to New York. <laughs> yeah, and if you ever come to New York, man, we'd love to host you and, and take you around and show you the sights and stuff. It would be awesome to have you. Yeah, for sure. I'll let you know. <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Everybody out there, again, keep safe, stay healthy, uh, love one another, be kind to one another, because that's what we need right now, and stay connected. Um, and it's great to see everybody coming on, and uh, you know, keep keep doing what you're doing, because uh, hopefully we get through this. All right. God bless everybody. Take care until next week, everybody. Episode four. It's a wrap with Alex Stewart. Thanks for tuning. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks, Alex.